Hello and welcome. This presentation is brought to you by the Ami de l'Université de Luxembourg and also by the University of Luxembourg. Thank you very much for joining. The topic is Wittgenstein. Specifically, this is a conference and painting exhibition called The Limits of Our World, Discovering the Fascinating Thinking of Ludwig Wittgenstein. My name is Rick Serrano and I will have the privilege and the honor to guide you tonight through this presentation and then later on through the painting exhibition of the same name that I have created. So let me start by telling you that uh, I am really very honored to be here tonight at, at the university here in Belval uh, with all of you because this project has gone really through a long history. It's been a long way and I would like to share it with you very quickly. We uh, Everything started back in 2009 down in Mexico City where I was studying a, my master's degree in philosophy and I was asked by the professor to prepare a diagram that I will be describing later on in the presentation. That was back in 2009. Then the thing continues in 2016 when I was living in Milan in Italy and I started creating the first paintings of the exhibition. Then in 2018 we presented them for the first time in Vienna and then in 2019 I was promoting the exhibition to be presented here in Luxembourg and that was the year when I had the privilege of um, getting to know Rolf Tarach and then the, we had big plans for the exhibition with Rolf and with many other people here in Luxembourg and then 2020 came with the pandemic and everything got a little bit stocked and we were getting to a moment when um, I was even hesitating that anything would be ever done but then things got back on track and here we are today 8th of December 2021 finally here uh, to be uh, exhibiting these paintings to you and to be presenting you this uh, conference so let me uh, say a special thanks, of course, to, first of all, all the uh, staff of the University of Luxembourg, Tania, Carlos, Daniele, and Galina, who have been very, very helpful in setting everything up. And of course, a big thank you to Dr. Georg Mein and to Professor uh, Thomas Raleigh for believing in the project and for giving us the opportunity to be here presenting. Of course, nothing of this could have been possible without the help of Romain Penning, of the Ami de l'Université, who has played a fundamental role in organizing and making this uh, happening tonight. And of course, um, the maximum help has been provided by, by Dr. Rolf Tarach, who is uh, here with us tonight. And I especially thank you, Rolf, for all your support and for believing in the project. I also need to give a special recognition to the co-artists, because some of the paintings have uh, received um, input from the artists uh, Yaya Bayoki, Dominique Schuller and Nepo James, so uh, respectively down in Milan and in Tokyo. Thank you very much for, for your support uh, to the project. And also, I cannot uh, uh, not mention doc Dr. Fernando Álvarez Ortega of the Jesuit University in Mexico, who uh, basically introduced me to Wittgenstein many years ago and who asked me to create that diagram that then gave birth to the exhibition and of course to Dr. Luis Vergara Anderson also from the Jesuit University in Mexico City who um, always pushed me to uh, go and continue developing this project. So uh, enough for introduction, thank you very much and uh, let me start by uh, telling you that the exhibition as um, I have mentioned gravitates around the creation of the book by Wittgenstein, the book called Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, which is this small book that I have here in my hands. It's a, a, a very small book, it's actually just seven pages uh, of content, and it was printed in 1921. So that is the reason why we meet here tonight, because we are celebrating the 100 years of the publication of the Tractatus. And let me tell you that uh, this is very important that we celebrate here tonight, because Actually, the whole world of um, culture and, of course, of philosophy, humanities, the whole world is celebrating this centennial this year. And there are events uh, running uh, all over the globe 
to commemorate the 100 years of the publication of the book. And uh, because of the pandemic, we were very close to not being able to organize anything in Luxembourg. But uh, thanks to the support of the people that I mentioned before, and thanks uh, to, of course, a lot of work, uh, we have been able to do uh, two events here in Luxembourg. This is the second one. This is also very important because the paintings will remain in exhibition for the next couple of weeks. So that is especially important that we are being able to celebrate in Luxembourg as well as in every other major city from Vienna to New York, from London to Singapore, that they are celebrating the centennial of uh, the publication of the tractate. So this is this is the book that gave birth to everything that we are discussing and, and seeing tonight. And let me tell you that the book is, is, is a very special book because it's not written like like any other philosophy book this is really more like i call it like a brain teaser it's really you know the book is composed of seven chapters and, and it includes not text not like prose text but it includes what wittgenstein calls propositions so it includes sort of like 200 propositions so small sentences so it doesn't contain any arguments as such but rather it's like declarative statements that are meant to be self-explanatory because, of course, Wittgenstein expects not only that you um, read his book, but that you understand it like almost automatically because he believes that the propositions are self-explanatory and they are so brilliant that they contain a lot of truth, each and every one of them. So he expects you to learn them very easily and very rapidly assimilate them, no? Uh, so it's a very particular book in the way it is written and this is important for our purposes now um, the publication of the book it, it was also not easy it took uh, Wittgenstein uh, three years from the time he finished the manuscript to the time it got published uh, and it took him three years and a lot of efforts to have it published he needed to go from one editor to the other uh, you know, in those days, publishing was not like today, right? Today, today, if you have a good manuscript, even if you don't have a good manuscript, as long as you have a manuscript, as long as you have a script, you simply can go to Amazon KDP and you can publish it literally overnight at almost zero cost. But, you know, in those days, it was definitely not that easy. In those days, it took a lot of time to uh, convince editors uh, you needed to convince the editors to publish your book and you needed to have very solid arguments for that so that they believed that the book could be a good business and could be also reputationally very good. So, um, as I was saying, uh, um, it took him three years. He went from one publisher to, other, to the other, knocking doors, uh, trying to have it published and people would not publish it because they said, you know what? This book is very strange and we don't understand it. So it, it will be a failure uh, from a sales perspective. And, and, and so we're not publishing. But Wittgenstein insisted and he said, you know, I am even willing to pay because, of course, he was a millionaire. He could pay for that. But even, even with payment, the publishers were rejecting the publication because they said it is risky for our reputation. So no. So it was for Wittgenstein was very frustrating that he was knocking on doors all over Europe and nobody wanted to publish it. Then what happened is that at some point uh, uh, Wittgenstein got to got to know Gottlob Frege, professor of philosophy in Germany, and Gottlob Frege told him, you know, I have uh, seen your your manuscript and it actually has a lot of value. Uh, I, I think it has a, a lot of uh, important uh, information inside of it. So. Uh, I recommend you to keep trying to publish it, but it is not, you know, it's not me who can help you. The the one who can actually help you is Bertrand Russell. Russell, who was uh, at that time a very famous philosopher in um, in uh, uh, at Cambridge, at Cambridge University in the UK, he made it possible. Uh, he made it possible because he read the book and he said, you know, this book is indeed uh, important and interesting, but nobody's going to publish it because nobody knows you. But I'm going to do you a favor. And the favor I'm going to do to you is that I will write a, a fourth word. I will write a prologue so that people, the editors might publish you because it has my blessing. 
And that's exactly what Russell did. He wrote a long, long um, protocol, which by the way, Wittgenstein did not like. But anyway, that was the that was the, 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 what helped the publishers to get convinced. And then they published the book. And the book became, uh, in, the, in the following year, the book was already a success at uh, Cambridge and at Oxford. And everybody was talking about uh, the Tractatus. And then later on, it became the most accepted and the most recognized book of logic and uh, of philosophy, especially in those uh, couple of years. Uh, all over uh, the world in the universities at, at the schools of philosophy. So it turned out to be a very big success. That's uh, what happened thanks to Russell's prologue. But it was not easy, as I was saying, it was not easy for Wittgenstein to get to that point. Now, uh, the book is the, um, the basis of the painting exhibition, and this is what we are celebrating the centennial of. Now, the book is also interesting because, um, you know, um, the, the book is, as I was saying, not, not easy to understand at all. And actually, you could even ask yourself, what is this book about? And there could be even a doubt whether this is a book of philosophy, this is a book of logic, is this a book of ethics, maybe? Is this a book of language? Uh, well, all of, the, all of those categories could apply. It could be philosophy, it could be logic, it would be ethics, it could be language. But definitely one of the things that, uh, at least in my view, in my free personal interpretation of the book, is that definitely language is the backbone of the book. So uh, Wittgenstein is going to be preoccupied with language. He is sometimes referred to as the philosopher of language. So definitely is like the axis the backbone uh, um, uniting all the components of the book. So at least I think we can be clear of that. So uh, as I was uh, explaining in the, in the beginning of the presentation, uh, when I was back in 2009, starting my, my master's degree in philosophy, um, the professor, uh, Dr. Fernando Alvarez Ortega, asked us to create not an essay, which is the typical way to evaluate philosophy uh, students, but to come up with a diagram. And uh, some of the students were a little bit shocked uh, about the fact that they were being asked to create a diagram. But in my case, I felt very comfortable because I, you know, being an engineer, being an MBA, I am used to creating diagrams. And uh, for me, it was relatively uh, an interesting and not so complex exercise. So what I tried to do is I basically tried to dissect the um, Tractatus in little pieces that I could understand or that at least I could enjoy. And um, maybe to say that I understand it, it would be too arrogant and too ambitious. Uh, I certainly don't, but I, but I definitely enjoy it a lot. And I think that my, my free interpretation of it dissects it uh, and, and the way I started of course is simply by following the seven chapters. So the seven chapters uh, uh, talk about uh, you know uh, seven seven big blocks so the world exists the things in the world, logical pictures, thoughts, etc some other things that I will get into detail a little bit later on. But the important thing what I really want to tell you is that uh, in my in my view in my eyes Wittgenstein is a true philosopher he's a real philosopher and why do I say that because he's actually trying to make sense of the world what he, what he's aiming at with his complex li little book is to try to explain to himself first of all and then to the rest of the world he's trying to explain the world he's trying to explain everything so that is not surprisingly why the first chapter is the world. And the second chapter is about things existing in the world. And then it gets more complex and more interesting because he starts talking about how we create logical pictures of what we see in the world, of what we, of what there is in, out there in the world. That is chapter three. And then chapter four, he goes and talks about, okay, once that you have those pictures, then you you are going to put it into thoughts. So there, there are going to be thoughts in your brain. And then when you put the, in the thoughts, you will pass them through uh, what is called uh, tables of truth. So uh, functions that allow you to verify 
the validity or not validity of those thoughts and then you come up with prepositions and then we will see silence in the end but you know it's uh, that's my free interpretation of how things work now that's uh, let me say that's level one of the tractatus now if you if you delve if you drill in a little bit and you go to the second level then you get what is inside of each and every one of those blocks like for example the world the world is everything that is the case and what the case is is the existence of atomic facts and and stay with that atomic facts so he's trying to say that things in the world are composed of those little little things that can be independently uh, analyzed and studied and then you will make the the picture of th of facts and and will that you will come up with a thought and the th the thought will give birth to significant propositions and then you will pass those prepositions through the functions of truth to see whether they are true or false and that way he's aiming he's struggling we have heard from the description of professor raleigh about the life of wittgenstein and that is very important because that tells you that shows you how tormented he was and how his life was a real struggle going from one extreme to the other going from one feeling to the other leaving one profession taking another one going from one city to another one totally obsessed sometimes totally quiet some other times he's all the time trying to explain the world and that is exactly what the tractatus is all about in my in my view of things so this is a uh, level two and then what i like the most is this part so maybe chapters two and three for me these are the key to um to the tractatus also because for me they are the key to the connection with art so basically chapter three where he says we make logical pictures of facts and those logical pictures will become a thought now let me let me tell you something that i think is very important to be mentioned because there was an event that happened in um, in paris in those years let me tell you let me show you a photograph to illustrate this uh, so in paris approximately in 1940 there was a car accident of course the photograph is not from 1940 but bear with me that's the only photograph i could find of car accidents in paris and uh, i just want to give you the idea of this you know because this is an event that marked wittgenstein's thought what happened is that uh, back in 1914 there was this crash imagine just imagine a big crash big car accident in paris there you see and that's Paris. Now imagine there somebody got hurt, somebody got blamed, you know, bloody sidewalk. Maybe the police got involved. Maybe they, they were not very clear about what happened. It was a complex accident there in Paris. So what happened? The police could not determine who was responsible simply by describing the accident and by taking the testimonials of the, the witnesses. So what they did, and for the first time what they did back in 1914, is that they created a model and at the trial uh, pe the people uh, describing the accident were using car toy cars and dolls to represent of course not like this with a computer but they were representing with things with models with little cars and with little dolls they were showing and representing what had happened at that car accident to try and determine who was responsible and who was to blame and why things have happened that way now here it's important to stop and think well why is this important or why was this important to wittgenstein well it was very important it was very important because the accident and the way it was treated made made the news and, and then wittgenstein read the newspapers and when he read those n n newspapers he got like an like an eureka moment and he said wow this is exactly what i was trying to say this is exactly what I was trying to explain and this is what the Tractatus is all about because he says some things in life cannot be explained with words sometimes words are not enough to describe and to represent what has happened but we need to make pictures of it we need to use models we need to show what has happened rather than to speak about it we need to explain it with dolls and models and figures and, and pictures and and that is why it becomes very relevant and then from there 
uh, Wittgenstein starts developing the whole uh, the whole edifice of his thinking because now the things that happen in the world so now there is the world there is a world with a lot of content in it and then those contents are the things are the facts are the atomic facts and then from those I'm gonna make pictures of facts and from those pictures I'm gonna make thoughts and from those thoughts I'm gonna make the propositions and then I can verify them by passing them through the truth fu truth function so that's that's a whole edifice so that that's how the diagram got got started you see and you can go into the propositions one by one and then it goes more into detail there are very nice propositions some are very interesting some sound even silly but if you think of them they ha have a very important philosophical content each and every one of them uh, I believe and uh, but they are always trying to connect again thought with the sense with the world and what I have done in my diagram which you have a copy of is simply I have stated the the some of the propositions that I like the most and that I think explain the, 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 the best the composition of the Tractatus and always always they are heading towards the understanding of the world now let me highlight a couple of propositions for example this one with the star up here names resemble points and propositions resemble arrows I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this and also if a sign is not necessarily then it, it, it is meaningless so he's very preoccupied with how um, little things can be identified as, uh, as atomic facts and how some point to others and for that I, I bring you a couple of images here so let me show you uh, so for example names resemble points propositions resemble arrows so if you take an atom for example so the, the 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 neutrons or the electrons are single points but maybe maybe and this is my interpretation maybe the orbit is like an arrow right and the orbit makes sense gives sense to the whole thing because it connects the things you know? let me show you another example of arrows the concept of arrow combining it with the concept of symbols because he cares about symbols and the meaning the meaning of symbols and the meaning that it is a meaning as long as it is used so if I give you a yellow arrow well that is a, that is simply an arrow right but the moment it becomes a, a symbol the moment it has a, a more than than not only being a point but the moment it gives you context because it sh represents something then that arrow becomes a useful symbol and a useful symbol can communicate many things like for example this yellow arrow can communicate a lot of things and I only give you the arrow I'm gonna show it to you again I only give you the arrow and you get the full picture you don't need the, the rest of the image but you people who know that symbol people who use that symbol people who use this symbol they know we're talking about this and by the same token if you don't know what this is there's no way you can figure it out unless you know what that means there's no way you can figure out this means the pilgrimage of Santiago de Compostela in Spain this makes reference to the shells in Santiago that were shining one day in a cave uh, you know this means a, a pilgrim this means um, adventure this means uh, religion this means so many many things right so that is what Wittgenstein is worried about that symbols represent things and that they mean things and that as long as they mean something they are alive and they die the moment they, there's no meaning left there no? now I was uh, saying before that language is the backbone of the whole philosophy and that's exactly the way it is language is going to be connecting all the propositions because what he is looking for is significance meaning explanation of the world so language is going to be the axis for example throughout chapter 4 which is about thoughts and how we create significant propositions out of thoughts everything is going to be around that and he's trying again to make sense uh, he also uh, identifies that there are propositions that could be logic but that could be tautology so the, he, there's like there are things in the world that well are well constructed but don't have a lot of sense maybe don't add a lot of value let me put it in that in that context maybe they don't add a lot of value to understand the world and to make sense of things 
but you know mathematically they could be they could be valid right so he starts to struggle a little bit because sometimes they could have value but mm, do they connect to the world how and he's puzzled by that he's puzzled he's very interested by that in any way the language keeps on being the axis connecting all the prepositions throughout the tractatus he's trying to determine whether something is true or false can something be true or false if it is logical if it is not can i can i make sense of things there are clearly things that don't make sense there are others that make sense but they all somehow connect with the world and then there is the world of the things that i am allowed to do the things that i should avoid doing the things that i should promote or avoid so a, a, a big connection with the with the ethical uh, with the ethical dimension in any case he's very concerned about the capacity to express something let me also drill down in this proposition because it's, i think it's a beautiful one uh, one of the paintings shows it uh, in, in detail now the capacity to express something is something that fascinates him and worries him because he says well you know what i am concerned about how our brain or how our we connect things in the world you know something might have meaning but does it have meaning for me you might speak some language but um, am i able to understand it and uh, uh, if uh, he makes a, a nice proposition saying if a lion could speak we could not understand him it sounds very silly but think of it if a lion could speak you could not understand him the reason why is simply because we cannot understand the world of the lion that is why the exhibition is called the limits of our world because the preposition the limits of our language uh, set the limits of our world if you don't understand one context of things you cannot enter that world literally you cannot enter that world if you speak a language of some other people then you can get into that language and i don't mean language like german or french or spanish what i mean is the context of things so even if a lion would could speak english we could not understand him because we have never been a lion we have never needed to to you know hunt a zebra to eat and we have never had uh, so many lions in uh, right we we don't know the context of that so even if he spoke our language we could not understand him and if you think that is silly if you think that is silly let me just give you a silly example of how some of the things uh, don't make sense because we can simply not connect them because they uh, escape our dimension uh, of time for example let me show you one photograph that i think is very eloquent a young person a generation z person could never know how these two objects connect and yet you know very well how these two objects connect and the only reason you know is because you used to live in a world where those two objects were connecting and where those two objects were uh, used in combination right so a generation z could never tell you even if you explain what the above is and and of course the pencil he knows but even if you explain separately what those two are uh, objects uh, were for uh, he or she could never understand why i show them together on this slide but you can now even more uh, if i were to explain this to a, a generation z uh, he or she for example could never understand why i give an a what i write an a on this side of the cassette or what is this 64 60 60 minutes maybe but i mean music has no time so why do i need that and let alone the holes on the top right what is that for that is because we don't speak the language that is because they don't speak our language in this respect that is because the symbols are not making sense at all so that is what was in my interpretation of things worrying him now he there, there's many interesting propositions like this one here for example the world is independent of my will and the world of the happy is quite another than the that of the unhappy so here again the world is independent of my will i am here in front of the universe i i bring you this paint this is a photograph of a, a, a painting by mexican painter existentialist mexican painter rufino tamayo uh, who shows this man in front of the galaxy so the human being is there 
in front of a galaxy, in front of the universe, in front of the immensity of the universe, and the human dimension is so tiny and so small and so insignificant, the world exists completely independent of my, of my will. I am so irrelevant. I am so tiny. I am nothing. You know, if I am super lucky, I might live a hundred years if I am very lucky. The universe has been there for how many years? Well, maybe Rolf could tell us that, but uh, it's so many, many millions of years that we are independent. The world is completely independent of my will. And yet, and yet, the world of the happy is quite another than the world of the unhappy. Then, then here is the human being, the single human being, uh, Wittgenstein, struggling with his existence, struggling with his uh, sad life. Three brothers committed suicide, struggling with a lot of money, struggling with that. Now, uh, the diagram continues, you know, uh, exploring different uh, different propositions, trying to make a sense of the world, trying to explain uh, what can be done, what can be communicated, what cannot be communicated. He asks himself over and over, can I communicate everything? So he goes and writes six chapters full of propositions, and then he comes to the very last uh, proposition of the sixth chapter. In the very last proposition of the sixth chapter, proposition 6.54, he says, maybe all of my propositions, everything that I have said so far, maybe is senseless. Maybe it doesn't make sense at all. Maybe everything that you have just read, and sorry for keeping you reading up until proposition 6.54, maybe all of that is crap. Maybe it doesn't make sense. So what? So what? Well, so silence, big silence. The chapter number seven has only one proposition and it says, whereof one cannot speak, we shall remain silent. So silence is the only element of chapter seven and this is a way he's gonna close it and is the masterpiece is closed by that big silence. Now, what happens given that silence? Because you cannot explain the world any further. You have tried, you have broken it down into little atoms. You have made pictures of thoughts. You have turned that into propositions. You have passed those propositions through the filter of truth and, and false. Uh, you have tried to come up with something. And then, maybe it doesn't make sense. So we need to keep silence. So what? Well, that's, in my view, that is where art kicks in. And that is why I have created the exhibition, The Limits of Our World, not to talk to you about the Tractatus, but to show it to you in paintings. And tonight here at the University uh, of Luxembourg, here in the Velval campus, we bring you 10 of the paintings. There are more, but we bring you the main 10 paintings of the exhibition. Each and every one of them uh, tries to give you some hints, not an explanation, but maybe some hints and maybe generate some interest for you for the tracta about the Tractatus and about the possible explanation of uh, what Wittgenstein was thinking and feeling about it. So let me just super quickly walk you through the paintings. This is the first painting, is the introduction. It represents like a brain opening. The seven chapters of the Tractatus are around it and it shows the, uh, the seven chapters, the seven blocks of it. Connecting, there is also, of course, a fil rouge connecting the seven chapters. And then there is uh, the eyes of Wittgenstein uh, staring at you, checking if you are trying to make an intellectual effort to understand it. He's going to be there, but he wants you to open up the Tractatus and try to discover it. So that's uh, painting number one. Painting number two, I selected here the axis, which is language, the backbone, and the connection with the world, with the sense and nonsense, with the ethics. And you, you see the propositions are there, but they sort of tremble. They are not like totally stable. They're sort of move and try to connect. And uh, painting number three, I tried to show in a turmoil. I will, of course, tell you more when we walk uh, through the paintings. But basically here, there's turmoil, there's confusion, there's, uh, there's like a revolution in my head. What is making sense? How am I explaining myself to the world? Can I pass that through my brain? Can I put that through the tables of truth? Painting number four is about the limits of the world. 
That is why I selected this square pattern. You can of course recognize the Burberry pattern because I wanted to bring something uh, very English because of his uh, almost 20 years at Cambridge University. So here is Wittgenstein with the squares, with the cubes, the limits of the world and um, defined by the limits of my language. On this one, I wanted to uh, bring into the picture, I wanted to bring uh, Gottlob Frege into the picture, Bertrand Russell and the story of the rhinoceros that I will be very glad to tell you in a moment uh, during the cocktail. Uh, and then uh, picture number six is where we start making connections between the, um, uh, the world of figures and the thoughts. Here you will see photographs by uh, artist uh, Yaya Bayoki uh, from Milan incorporated into my paintings and how they bring uh, the, 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 the images of the world, the pictures of the world into our thoughts. This one also from logical pictures, we create thoughts again with photographs of uh, Bayoki here on this uh, painting and the world trying to make sense. You see the squares, what uh, I, I use the squares, but they are not perfect squares, not perfect rectangles. I'm trying to express that we're making an effort to make sense. It's not super evident, but we're making that effort. Uh, painting number eight uh, represents basically the connection with those propositions that are redundant and with those propositions that we can, uh, to some uh, extent, not complete and not understand. Picture number nine is simply uh, uh, going into the thoughts <clears throat> going into the thoughts and trying to explain this, also bringing some element of music, because of course the Wittgenstein family was a very musical family. And one of his brothers, Paul, who lost his right arm in the war, in the first war, uh, he uh, received uh, as a present from Maurice Ravel, the concerto uh, for, the, for the left hand. And there you have the music sheet of that. And you can um, you can see the painting uh, connecting those two elements, so the elements of the Tractatus, but also of the life of Wittgenstein coming up here. And then finally, I close this uh, exhibition with the painting number ten, which is called "Green Chaos Needed." Why? Because everything that was going on in his brain was, of course, very on was creating a big unrest, and at sometimes Wittgenstein simply needed to go away, to escape and go to the green and to go to Norway. And he had this cottage up in Norway he, where he would escape to or he would go to the Austrian Alps or to Wales. He wanted to escape from, from reality and from the torments of his brain. He wanted to avoid all of that and he wanted to, to move and get lost into the green. So that is what I try to represent with this painting. Well, with that, and uh, let me thank you very much for your attention. I hope that you will enjoy the exhibition and that you will enjoy the cocktail with us. Let me thank once again uh, Dr. Um, Georg Mein for his hospitality and all of the people of the University of Luxembourg and of course Rolf Tarak, thank you very much. Uh, I uh, also invite you to follow me in my YouTube channel. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Rick Serrano from Luxembourg, goodbye.